Okay, welcome, buddy. Hey, I think we are live. We're a little bit early. I started. I was going to plan this for like eight thirty, but um, Landon was here early. I was here early. We we're like, eh, might as well go live because you know, in the next, I, I figure if we went live a little, a little bit early, if Beetlejuice actually exploded in the next fifteen minutes, that'd be really, really awesomely cool. Although the statistical probability is pretty much negligible to, to nothing. And, of course, Landon would probably be upset because he's not outside watching it right now. But, anyways, we're going to be having a, uh, an impromptu from a Coke night. I wasn't planning to have one today. Actually, I was going to not do anything tonight. But uh, Landon wanted to talk about Beetlejuice. I was like, well, how am I going to turn that down, right? So I got a little little bit of scotch, not much. It's like a quarter of a finger because uh, I'm still recuperating from having, like, two shots of scotch for drunken peasants. That's how little I drink. Uh, but I got my Glen Livet here. The, but, you know, so I got the good stuff breaking out for you, Landon. Had this for God knows how many months. So excellent, excellent. And what are you having, my friend? Well, I am uh, have a, I have a range of things, but I, I often ha I have to have a rum and a coke because someone has to do the R and C. And and I guess you I, I blame you because you made me you know get one of these little cute little cans when I have that. So if I'm gonna do that, um, I have for the Canadians a burrowing Alpino Grease, uh, Canadian fine Canadian wine. Yes, Canada does make wine, and I highly recommend it. I have some Copperworks uh, single malt distillery from Seattle, and I've got some Jack Daniels Rye, and I've got some French Polynesian. Uh, wow! So you definitely got the good stuff. Yeah. Okay, so people are going to see. I, I I didn't have a little the screen thing on. So yeah, that's a little bit of my Scotch, people. That's all I got. Um, it's a Glenlivet twelve bottle because they didn't see it. They saw your stuff, but they didn't see my bottle. So there excellent. So anyways. Uh, I'm glad you're doing okay. I, I mean, I know you've been busy doing volcanism stuff and volcano stuff and sky stuff and fun stuff and computer stuff. You've just been busy doing kind of everything. Yeah, it's it's a, I I continue to live in my favorite universe and it doesn't uh, disappoint me in certain aspects. Do you got do you got any choice on that, by the way? <laughs> well, I, given all the universes I know of, this is my favorite. Yeah, mine too. But I think it's the only one that exists. Well. I mean, there's multiverses, but I consider the multiverse is still part of the one universe. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't, uh, you know, multiverse is an interesting concept, but it's not, uh, it would have any really good evidence that it actually exists, so. I ex well, I accept a level one multiverse, because if you, if a level one multiverse is just a Hubble volume, then, okay, yeah, then mm -hmm. we have a multiverse. But, but uh, by the way, Nick Sood is going to be debating uh, my friend Jeff Swearing. Dr. Swearing is a PhD in astrophysics that works for mm -hmm. Reasons to Believe. I was just in his office a few weeks ago, matter of fact, um, li like standing right in his office. He wasn't there at the day, uh, day but I've, I've talked to him before in person a few times. But um, he's doing a discussion on uh, does the universe prove God or something like that? Really? Yeah, I'm like I, I've read Swearing's book by the way, and his book is called "Who's Afraid of the Multiverse," and it's not a bad book. I mean, it actually is pretty decent for a small little book uh, that explains, in a layman's terms, the multiverse. And I'm like, yeah, it's pretty good. Uh, I don't think its conclusion falls, but um, you know, to have Nick Nick who, Suter, who's a philosopher, debate <laughs> Jeff Swearing, who's a physicist, astrophysicist, on you know, does the universe prove God or something like that? Um, no, I don't know if it's proved, but I mean, does I guess more along the lines, does the evidence of the universe demonstrate more likelihood of God? I guess I shouldn't say prove per se, but yeah, you know. But I was going to ask you, is, is his, is that title clickbait or does he actually attempt to try to prove? Well, I don't think it's going to be proved per se. And I, I swear it isn't a clip, clickbait, bait, but Jeff is, excuse me, um, uh, James is. James is the owner of Mo Modern Day Debate. I love James a lot. I watch Modern Day Debate, great channel, but he does like to, to change those those titles a little bit to be a little clickish, I, I've seen that happen. So, yeah. So I I don't know what the final thing is going to be because originally it's just going to be was our evidence for God, but I guess that got changed somewhere along the line. So, but anyways, we got some other people in here. We got Little Red. Hi, Little Red. You're gonna mute now, Little Red. She'll figure this out eventually. And we got James, who's who's the atheist who became agnostic who became a christian i know wait christian to atheist to atheist to agnostic to agnostic to christian hey, back to atheist hey what are you Hello. drinking what are you guys drinking anything i'm drinking Vosteiner. it's a german beer oh that sounds good Excellent. so did i get that right did you start out you went christian christian to agnostic to atheist to, to um Back to Christian, back to agnostic, back to atheist, back to agnostic. I don't know. You've been all over the place. 
I think I had uh, three and a half different positions in the span of a month. Hmm. And for full circle back to agnostic. Yeah, we just call that confused. <laughs> yeah. What, nothing, I mean, nothing, nothing wrong with, with, no, with no, changing your mind. I don't think it's wrong like either. either. But, but, but James, what, what, what type of beer is that you're drinking? What's, what's the style of beer? Uh, it's just called Vosteiner is what it says on it. I get it from uh, Kroger's. It was the same one that the my wife's foreign exchange student sister brought from Germany. Like, is it a dark beer? Or is it a light beer? Or is it a... I don't know beers that well. <laughs> Landon does. Landon's a beer and wine connoisseur. I mean, he's like a sommelier. I just the name was Vosteiner. Actually, he trains sommeliers or something like that. I don't know. He's got some weird high-level fruity cork sniffy stuff. <laughs> yeah. Oh, nice. He's a cork sniffer, yeah. Yeah, definitely definite cork sniffer. So so here's my uh, here's my rum and, rum and coke. Uh, with uh, I'm using the Bacardi uh, eight-year thing with 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 a coke and it has a cute little footballs on it this is steve maybe get this i i i didn't do anything <laughs> so and we just had a uh, stone butt show up <laughs> Addy. hey buddy by the way uh, i am giving links out so if you want to join message me i, I put it on patreon and some other places so um but we're going to dive into it while we're i'm putting out the link so uh, Landon, who, as you guys know, is a computer scientist, astronomer, mathematician, all around just, you know, one of the smart guys. Um, literally, like, one of the smartest people on the planet. Go look at his Wikipedia. Uh, oh, I just got a follower. Fourth generation veteran, USMC. Uh, Semper Fi, thank you for your service. Chesty's children, upgraded membership to Curious Follower. Thank you, fourth generation, fourth generation veteran. Um, so, Landon... Um, You've been following this Beetlejuice stuff pretty closely, and uh, I know that you would love to see it go supernova like tomorrow, but uh, that's probably not going to happen. But can you kind of tell people what actually is going on with that star? It's right here, by the way. You can't see it. You're muted. You're, you're muted. You're muted. Sorry, it went yeah. it went off on me. Um, anyway, so so yes. Uh, I, by the way, I use the um, uh, the Betelgeuse pronunciation. There's actually are different pronunciations of it. So if I say Betelgeuse and he says Betelgeuse, I say Betelgeuse. Yeah. Um, but it's it's one of the stars in the constellation of Orion, and if you look at the nice little map that's behind uh, Steve's head, there, um, sure. you see it's one of the it's one of the shoulders. Now, depending what? on. Whether you're on the northern hemisphere or southern hemisphere, what? Or the upper or the lower. Hang on, what did you say? hang on, hang on. Reds, can you drop? I, I'm not. I, I can't. It's just too much background noise. I love you, but this is probably not going to be the hangout for you. <clears throat> Reds, little red. I'm, I'm trying. All right. Thank you. Sorry. I love you. Can you figure it out? I I can't remove anybody because we're using Google Hangouts, so. I don't know. Restart the phone, maybe. Can you figure it out how to can just just exit because it it just keeps going it keeps unmuting. So, all right, so Landon, go ahead. Sorry about that. Okay. No worries, no worries. Um, so anyway, so so uh, the, the the exciting about this this star, I mean, Betelgeuse is actually a fairly interesting star, but the real excitement has been uh, that it has dimmed quite a bit. In fact, I looked at the, I was just looking at the measurements, brightness measurements, and since um, um, early November, it's dimmed about you know by a factor of about one point six. And in terms of you can actually go out out if you when if you're a clear night and see Orion. Um, the Betelgeuse is the is the star that's sort of the reddish thing. The other corner would be uh, Rigel, which is sort of the bluish corner, the opposite corner of, of, of Orion in terms of the box. And it used to be that Betelgeuse and Rigel were about the same brightness. Now, um, for the I'll do it for the Northern Hemisphere people. The the Betelgeuse would be sort of like the, the if you will the left shoulder left shoulder upper shoulder of, of orion and i don't think this actually shows um, all of orion does it is the, is the is it doesn't show it it doesn't named on that but okay. Bel Belgium is the other 
uh, shoulder. And it used to be that that Betelgeuse was, was about the same brightness as the Rigel, the, basically would be the right foot for the Norman, Norman Hemisphere people. Now it's about the brightness of uh, Bellatrix, and, 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 it's, and it continues to get dimmer. And that's and and that caused a lot of excitement because it's 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 historically it's well it's a variable star it it, it varies in brightness um, this this dimming is 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 quite exceptional and uh, we thought maybe there were it has kind of two uh, dimming modes one that's sort of slow cycle one that's a, a large cycle we thought basically both of those are superimposing and getting a dimmer stuff but it but it's it's uh, certainly exceeded that dimming cycle by quite a bit. Um, and so people are quite excited about this and what that might mean about about the star in its um, current phase. So it, it's dropped about what a half a magnitude in brightness, intrinsic brightness. It's actually dropped. It's actually dropped uh, 1.65 magnitude. Oh, that's quite a bit. I mean, that's that's noticeable. That By the naked noticeable eye. And in, in the in the set there. So so given that given that it's sort of a you know a, approximately a two point five power. Um, so in that particular case, if you look at that 2.54 to the 1.6, um, the, the dimming factor is, shows about, um, there's a comma there, uh, it's about, dimming factor of almost about four now. So it's, it's in terms of, of, of absolute output. Now, this particular, you know, a 1.6 dimming in, in, in brightness, it, it basically, the Betelgeuse was somewhere around the top nine, top definitely in the top 10 brightest stars in the sky. Now it's about number 24, 25. And so the question is, well, why? Um, and one of the things that about, uh, about Betelgeuse in terms of the type of star, it's called a red supergiant. And it's one of the largest stars that we, that we know of. If you replaced the sun with Betelgeuse, the the surface of Betelgeuse would be some about halfway between uh, here and um, and Jupiter. It would start, definitely swallow the orbit of, of Mars and get you know somewhat close to, to Jupiter. So it's a fairly fairly sizable star, fairly massive. It's about we think we estimate it somewhere around maybe uh, as much as twelve times the mass of our sun. It's a it's a very, um, it puts out a lot of light. Um, it's, a, it's somewhere around 100,000 times the amount of light uh, than our sun. Though, because it's a big surface area, such a big surface area, it, the, the, the surface looks actually somewhat dim, um, you know, from per, 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 per section. Um, it's, it's a relatively young star. Uh, the est current est best estimates, it's about two, about eight and a quarter million years old. And we think, given where its phase is, massive stars live a very short amount of time and then, and then, you know, end their life in a spectacular explosion called a supernova. Our sun is not a massive star. I mean, it's, it's big, but it's not big as far as stars go. And it will, you know, go shine another six to six and a half billion years before it shrinks down and become a, a white dwarf after going through its giant phase. Betelgeuse, on the other hand, will. Uh, end up um, going through various phases of fusion at core, and when it begins to fuse iron, or Ooh, to fuse iron, it's 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 all over, right? It's going to its its fusion reaction is going to take absorb energy rather than give off energy, and and gravity is going to crush the thing down, and and, and it will um, most likely end in a spectacular explosion, including a creation of a black hole. But don't worry. Uh, we're far enough away from it. We're not in, in alignment with poles. So we won't get the, the nasty gamma pulses or some sort of thing. We'll get a nice bird's eye view of it, but it won't be dangerous to the uh, to, to Earth. It'll give us a lot of information about how stars die because they're very important in terms of how planets like ours form. So April R Van R R April says for five Canadian, Beetlejuice is pronounced Beetlejuice. But we still love you, Landon. Uh, I want it to blow this summer. And uh, he kind of went over that different ways of pronouncing it. Now, I do pronounce it um, as Beetlejuice as well. Uh, he says it's, it's – you pronounce it as how? Betelgeuse. 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 And it's a different, different accepted pronunciation. So I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with, with Steve. We're just using different – He just wants to sound cooler, that's all. Yeah. You know, but, but. – but uh, yeah, the chances of blowing this summer are pretty slim to none. Now, yeah. so so a couple of things. Um, 
stars that are, are bigger, red giant, um, that are only a few million years old or, you know, nowhere near the age of the sun, because the sun is a main sequence, uh, was an F2 spectral class. G, G2. G2. Uh, G2 spectral class. And uh, that burns very long over a long period of time. Uh Red's yeah. Red's gonna have to. I'm gonna have to ask you to drop. I I can't have this mute background noise. It's just too distracting. I apologize. F please forgive me. But can you drop from the call? No. Can you actually drop? So. Thank you. Okay. So um, I I apologize. I, I I just can't have that scraping noise. I have people that have hard hearing and they they hear that scraping and it just it's hard on their ears. Hurt of mine too. But so the red giants, they tend to burn their fuel pretty quickly. Yes. I mean, again, uh, the, the lifetime of a star about about 10 times the mass of our sun is about 11, it's around 11.6, um, has a lifetime maybe around 9 million years, where our sun will go through a, a, a pretty good you know, normal lifetime in around 10 billion years. Now, red, red dwarfs, you know, stars that are that are much cooler than our sun, much lower mass, can last up to a trillion years. So, uh, as I say, the big, the the bigger the the star you are, the faster you're going to the you know fuse through your core and the and fast die hard. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's that's one of the things that people are exciting is is that when 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 the star is basically going through um, these sort of dynamic changes, people are wondering, well, is it about ready to have its end of life? Best estimates right now is that it probably has at least a hundred thousand years before. Um, it goes supernova. However, there's a lot about massive stars we don't understand, which is like, well, it would be nice if Betelgeuse actually goes supernova because we could, we'll learn a lot. Yeah, and, and, and well, here's the thing. Okay, so Betelgeuse is, a, is about 642 light years away, right? So if it, there is a chance, slim as it may be, that it's not even there anymore. And that it might have exploded 642 years ago and it would we would see it tomorrow kind of thing, right? Again, very slim chance. So there is no way for us to have any way, any knowledge whatsoever under any circumstances to actually know whether Beetlejuice has explo exploded or not. It might have actually have gone supernova by now, but we would have no way of actually knowing it until the light actually reaches, it, reaches us, right? Well, it, it kind of depends upon... Um... And this is perhaps maybe. Are you going to talk about the neutrinos up? being like half a second faster? Oh no 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 no! Okay. I mean, I mean I, I, so it, could, it actually is perhaps a philosophical question of what does it mean? What do you mean by now? Uh, I'm going to be the presentism uh, for the way we can view it. We can never say like I couldn't say to you. I can t t tell you that Beetlejuice has gone nova because there's no information available to me. That's Pervy, I'm pervy to. I can never have any information whatsoever about that system until the information reaches us. And that reach information takes the same speed as the speed of light, which is 400, 642 years to get to us. So, and I, and I, I by the way, I, I, I agree with you in, in, in principle, which is why when you say, well, what's Betelgeuse is doing now? Answer is it's not going supernova. How do we know? Because we can observe it. Yeah. Now, if, but people say, well, what about now? Part of the problem with space time is assuming that your space and time is universal and physics says, uh, 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 right. Um, yeah. I'm talking about now, locality to, with us. Yeah. Our locality. Yes. And so, so, so for our now, which is the only thing we can measure, it has not gone supernovae. And you might say, well, what about if you were there? Well, if you were there and you were looking at our star, you would see our star at, at where it was at approximately, um, 1400 um uh ad or you know 1400 you're, you're 1400 you'd be seeing uh us your now by over there would be our past at 1400 see that that, that it's the language does not really is not really equipped to describe the sort of these sort of space time shifts so um the question is could it have gone supernovae well the answer is right now it hasn't now what are the chances that it, you know at that the uh, that we might see in our lifetime it goes supernovae and it actually it's fairly slim 
given if it, if it's if it sort of has an equal chance between now and the next hundred thousand years of uh, going supernovae, the chances are are relatively slim. It's like, it's like winning the lottery three times. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's just yeah. very slim. And 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 I mean, but 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 if it did, um, a couple of first of all, it'd be it'd be a fairly bright object in the sky. It would it would sort of it would rival the probably rival the the full moon in brightness. It would certainly you certainly be able to see the star in the daytime uh, for for several weeks. And then, of course, the, the other thing is that our gravity wave, the, the, the gravitational wave detectors like LIGO would, would go crazy because we'd see this big pulse most likely going through. We'd also see a giant pulse of, of, of these subatomic particles and neutrinos um, hit places like the ice cube detector in South Pole and so forth. And we'd learn a lot about the, um, some, of the, some of the physics around the, these brightest uh, and most energetic explosions that we can see in the universe. So it would be, be a fantastic learning experience. Um, but also, don't worry, because we're relatively safe distance, so it won't um, bother us. Yeah, um, and also the, the uh, axis uh, of rotation, the poles, are actually pointed that way is not this way toward yeah. us so if yeah. we, now what happens if it was i mean let's say that it, it, it went supernova it produced a, a, a g a gamma ray burst um a grb and it, the, the the thing was directed to us now 642 light years is still a pretty good distance but that's still a distance that can do, do heavy damage to the earth yeah i mean it certainly it certainly the satellites and so forth they have be heavy damage there probably would be some um smog generation you know that that is the radiation hitting the upper atmosphere um, causing some, some it, it wouldn't, it would, you don't think it, it would, it wouldn't be so strong to blow our uh, atmosphere off though, right? No, 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 that's not, not in that sense, but it would probably would damage instruments, mm -hmm. um, if it were directed in, in our, uh, direction we, we think, right. And, and one of the things that, 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 that we'll do when it, when we do observe it go supernovae is we'll be able to look along the axis of, of the jet of, of material off its poles and actually see what happens. Um, it'll be close enough for people to see, um, indirect effects and, uh, and major that. So with all the technology we have, how come we don't see more supernova? I mean, the last big one we saw, Supernova 1987A, um, which was pretty impressive. I mean, I've, I've, I've looked at the stellar fo photos over time of, of that nova, and it you can see a change over the last the decades. You, you actually can see the original explosion as compared to what it is now. It has actually changed. And just like the Krebs Nebula, you can see the actual nebula has actually changed. But how come we don't see a, like neb spot, uh, like them going off? There's there's quadrillions of stars out there. How come we don't see more supernovas? Like most of, them, most of them are too far to see. In in our in our galaxy, um, we think that given the rate of supernovae, that there's probably um, one going off in our galaxy maybe every century, and maybe one close enough for us to see um, in the naked eye about once every 400 years on, on average, right? Now, the one in 1987A was actually not in a galaxy. It was in the is in a dwarf galaxy orbit. It was, it was a large magellanic cloud, wasn't it? And um, I have to say, I was actually fortunate that um, I uh, was able to fly to Australia and I was on the ground 19 hours after it was discovered um, and, and actually saw the star changing in brightness and changing in color going through the, the, the supernova curve, you know, before my eyes, it was a quite a, it was quite an amazing experience to, to see that. It's one of the reasons why in my employment contracts, um, the, one of the clauses says landing goal gets to go to any place on the earth in the event of a supernova reaching, um, visible naked eye brightness. So no matter where you're at, that's actually in your contract that if there's a supernova, you drop what you're doing and you go. So if there was a naked eye supernovae, row this for this thing, I would say, sorry, see you later. And head there because again the the observations of those early phases are actually quite is quite in, important. Oh, I'm sure. Um, now that was a type two supernova, right? So there's there's a whole bunch of different types of supernovas. Um, so uh, the the most common is, is type two or more, type one is more common than type two, right? Uh, I, I mean, is type one one a is is it's a white to be associated with with the white dwarf, white dwarf right? Material accumulating on Dwight Dwarf to the point where it's fusion, you get a runaway fusion step. Type two tends to be sort of the um, clap of a large star. And by the way, there, there's type 1A, type 1B, type 1C. We, we've learned, but mainly the difference between type one and type two is whether or not the, um, the material is hydrogen rich or not. 
uh, and and that then turns into we've we've so we, we started classifying them based on how they looked and now with with understanding more about stellar physics have a better idea about what causes them and so the, but 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 again regardless of that uh, you know Betelgeuse would go through a type t two supernovae um, one of the things in particular that supernovae are really important for is creation of heavy elements. Most of the elements that are not like in, on Earth, if you if exclude hydrogen and you exclude some of the things like um, oxygen and some of the nitrous stuff, a lot of the heavier stuff, calciums, the silicons, the irons and so forth that are in Earth came from an early supernova explosion. So if our model of how our solar system formed was reasonably correct, then 4.8 billion years ago, a, a large star went supernovae. It created a shock wave that hit a gas cloud, just like you might see in Orion Nebula. It's one of those nice glowy, puffy gas clouds that cause it to, 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 to compress and it created a little nodule there and a little knot that had gravitational attraction and more hydrogen. So, the, so what became the, the protosun started forming. And then 4.7 billion years ago, a second nearby star went supernovae and that at dense knot caught more material that stuck into the set and that that dense material became um the cores of 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 our our planet so mercury venus earth mars um astro chunks and asteroid belt even the core in central cores of jupiter and saturn came from those two supernovae and uh so it these stars, when they go supernovae, seed the the rest of the you know the nearby surrounding space with material to create planets and other interesting. Yeah, our, our sun's been recycled. Our sun's like a third generation or something like yeah. that, isn't it? And yeah. and so these things are very important, right? They're they're if you will sort of life giving um, things that surrounding surrounding the sky. So supernovas and, and, are basically God. Or I think of them they're, they're like the massive tree that falls in the forest. Mm -hmm clears out the canopy, puts a lot of nutrition in the soil, you get an explosion of plant growth um, and, and a new a new cycle of, 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 uh, of material forms. And I find so, it fascinating with the light, with the, with the, they can actually tell what's what, uh, like on the LIGO, what's collapsing into what, like if a white store hit a supermassive uh, red giant, they, they know that's what, that's what occurred and uh, how much energy is released and they can plot these things. And I find that to be just, that, that those distances to be unbelievably, uh, it's something yeah. I wouldn't have imagined growing up in the eighties that they're able to do. I mean, back then, they even the thought of even having a, a black hole uh, picture of it was was pretty much unheard of. I, I don't think back in the eighties it would have been something that you and I would have been like, that's just not even possible. But now, you know, we can tell if two neutron stars are hitting. We can tell if it's type one, type one B. We can tell if it's type two, uh, just by the spectral lines and the energy emission and the and the, the gravitational waves. Uh, I think gravita gravitational waves are going to be the um, the whole new frontier of, of astronomy. It's going to be before we had radio astronomy kind of took over everything, and radio astronomy allowed people to see things that they just couldn't see with the naked eye. But now they have gravity, gravitational yeah, I mean, waves. That's, it, that's amazing. I mean, it, it, it's it's even because because you're right. There there are many. You know, if you talk about spectrum of radio waves and gamma rays, these are all just various frequencies of light. Mm -hmm. um, with these gravitational waves they're a whole different phenomenon that we can observe the universe through a whole different means. And um, there really are ripples in, in, in space, if you will, that when, when you have these sort of um, very energetic mass moving uh, experiences. And, uh, and so they, and also the nice thing about those, those things is that, that you, they, they, they propagate out. You can't, it can't like have dust clouds blocking it. It, it, you're able to see, if you will, or or, or experience the the pulse coming through, regardless of what's between you and the other, you know, and 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 the actual central event. Right. So it it really is a whole new way of looking at the universe. Um, and we've only seen a couple of these events, right? We've only detected a, a small handful right now of of these things. But the detectors are getting more uh more sensitive well the that fact that we've detected sense. but the fact we've, we've found a few means that we're going to be finding a lot more yes and and that being said you know that if you took about like you know in a typical year we find you know several dozen you know several dozen uh supernovae that that looking around 
through through all all space, monitoring many 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 different uh, galaxies. So you don't want to sit there and say, well, I'm going to be, make my career on waiting around for a supernova to happen nearby in our galaxy. You take what you can get, right? And so um, if you see something in a nearby galaxy, consider yourself fortunate. Most of the supernovae we detect are 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 pretty far out there, and but again, these these events are extraordinary in that they not only are they are they extraordinarily energetic, but they're also extraordinarily important in how the universe progresses. And they're very important on how solar systems form and planets form and all kinds of other good stuff. Okay, got a couple of things here. One, Super Chat first, Super, um, Jonathan L., $5 Australian. Steve, as a teen, I wanted to be a scientist, got sucked into conspiracies. I walked away from science. It ruined my life. You made me love science again. Thank you. Well, appreciate it, man. I, I, I'm... I love when people tell me that kind of stuff. I love when people have told me that they've gone back to school um, because they've watched things they've seen on this channel they, or they've, they want to get back into physics or they want to get into philosophy or, or reignited. Yeah. I mean, I, I can never stop getting tired of hearing things like that. Um, it just, it's the reason why I do what I do. And, and fortunately, as we all know, there's always drama going to be around. People are, you know, just, um, you know, they, they want, they want it to be, they, they, they hate when people actually try to put forth good stuff. And so th there's always going to be somebody riding on your ass. It is the way it is. We get it. Um, but I think that a lot of people are realizing now that drama, that's for other channels. You know, And we're happy now that we're getting back to this kind of stuff. And we're getting comments like this again. So I appreciate it very much. Somebody had asked, um, though, Orion Red asked, how do we know there's an Oort cloud? And, of course, the Oort cloud hasn't been confirmed, but the overwhelming probability, because upon observations of comments, suggests highly that there is such a thing. But, Landon, you want to address that one? I mean, cause, cause, so, so, yeah, the Oort cloud is, is considered to be the material which is hanging out at the very edge of where the sun's gravitational field can dominate. Um, and, and we have material coming in through the Kuiper belt. The Kuiper belt is, is sort of the edge of the uh, Neptune-Pluto zone of our, of our solar system. Yet we also see material coming in through, the orbits come through that Kuiper belt from much farther distance. We also can take, do calculations on the, 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 how the dynamics of, of motions of objects and, and speculate that there's a larger cloud of material very loosely associated with you know, the gravitational uh, field of our sun that that's that is bound there and so that it's defined as a material that is sort of at the edge of the influence of stuff now that or cloud stuff has um, a very tenuous uh, impact on it and as, as other stars you know come by quote near in astronomical sense um, they can disturb that or cloud cause things as sort of uh, orbits to to shift and some of them basically then quote, fall in towards the the center where we see them as comets, or sometimes they smack into us if we're unlucky. Now, would you think that like Betelgeuse would have like an Oort cloud as well, or something along those lines? I, I most, I, most it, systems. So one way we say is it, it probably does. On the other hand, I suspect that that we we know that that the star has a number of shells of material that's been ejected. Right mm -hmm. when we see it do outbursts, we see those photons hitting material surrounding it. And so it probably has had some exp spectacular explosions, you know, coronal mass ejections on a on a grand scale where it's shed material. Um, for example, when it went from fusing hydrogen to fusing helium, um, it created it started with a with a fusion core that was a that was going to much more energetic. That pulse caused the outer layers of the star to blow off, right, and inject it. And that's one of the larger tinge other shells we see are surrounding it so one of the explanations for why it might be dimming is that it went through an outburst and we're seeing material coming out from the star temporarily blocking the the light uh to some extent as it as it moves out it dissipates gets thinner and thinner and if so then the star's brightness which should return back to normal that's one possible explanation of what's happening. But we do, when, when we look at, because um, one of the thing about Betelgeuse is, is that it's actually close enough that we can actually see it as a disk. It's one of the few stars besides the sun that we can see is not a point source of light, but actually as a, as a disk. And depending on what wavelengths you look at, you can see the, maybe what, what is the, considered the photosphere, the, the opaque part of it, or you can see surrounding it 
sort of the surrounding gases of the atmosphere. And, and those are, are, are sort of been changing in size as it goes through various turbulences towards the end of his life. Max, um, real quick, Maximilian26 says, uh, ha so happy to catch you live, Landon. Excellent. And yes. by the way, thank you again for, for all these. Um, by the way, thanks again for your contributions uh, to this channel. It helps keeps it keep it going. Uh, so this is a channel I, I, I think that adds value to us and we should be supporting it as, as we can. And uh, by the way, too, and the, we get to drink guy, on this channel, too. Absolutely. This right? is my, my room. Fact, I'm going to I'm I'm indulge a little bit tonight. I already have my quarter of finger. So I'm gonna have a little bit, little bit more, not much. I have a little bit of rum and coke. And by the way, to the, to the Australian, there. Oh, here, cheers, sir. Yep, cheers. Yeah, put, here's, I'll pour a little bit more of this. Here's so. dynamic stuff. Um, to the Australian that, that's out there, uh, you might notice that I'm you wearing one of Friendly Jordy's um, uh, t-shirts about Clyde Palmer. Is a uh, well, you can see if 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 you know. If you tell, if you say Clive Palmer to most Australians, they will um, get that look on your face, like, why are you bring up nasty stuff like that? So we're being, I'm out here being positive, but I do apologize that I have the Clive Palmer T-shirt. It's not because I support Clive Palmer; it's because I support making fun of him. Yeah, and um, I, by the way, I was going to have Doctor Croon come on and join us tonight too, but it's a little late for him, and he you know, he wanted to, but he, he couldn't. But uh, he will be joining us later on this week. But I'm going to be bringing uh, Dr. Kroon on too. Plus, I'll probably bring on Dr. Jeff Swearink at some point as well again because he is an astrophysicist. But um, I want to get back into the uh, talking about the astrophysics type stuff in uh, sure. black holes and, and uh, supernova type stuff. So let's get back there in a second. Plus, I got a special guest here um, uh, real quick. So my finished journey, five dollars. Will Voyager and Pioneer ever achieve escape velocity and possibly reach other stars? And why don't you ask to hit landed in person on my finished journey? Yeah. Right, like, well, right, actually, hang on, hang on, hang on, right, right now, on my finished journey. Hello. Barely hear you. Are there? Try again. You're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. There we go. All righty. So you get to last land in real time. By the way, I don't think you've ever been in my hangout before, though. You've been around forever. Thank you, thank you. Hot my cherry. Yay! First hangout. I, I'll, I'll, wait, I, I know you've been in one of my hangouts before. I've been I've known you for a very long time, because you've been in my mod for a very long time. But you've never been in any hangout. Right. Wow. Officially a full on cherry pop. Yep. Cha ching. <laughs> Salute. Achievement unlocked. Yeah. There you are, sir. Cheers. All right. So what you got for Landon? Uh, so the question is. Uh, Will Voyager or Pioneer or any of those uh, you know, probes that we've sent out, will they ever, uh, have they achieved escape velocity from uh, from the sun and will they uh, yeah, exit our solar system and get to another star? Um, the answer is yes. They've already, they have sufficient velocity that uh, the sun won't slow them down and they will uh, leave our solar system. The question, of course, is what's the edge? We have a thing called a heliopause where uh, we define it as being the spot where the the wind coming from other stars interstellar space is becomes noticeably stronger than the wind from our star and right now voyager one and voyager two are in that 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 boundary zone where they're seeing the effects of winds from other stars more than our sun so you might like, like saying you're sailing down the amazon and you're still in fresh water and all of a sudden you start picking up hints of salt water as you move out in the Atlantic. Well, those probes have moved out to the point where they're getting much more salt water than fresh water. Um, so they're the two, the first two man-made objects that we know of that have moved beyond the, if you will, the bubble that's in, dominated by the influence of our sun into the interstellar space. Yeah. Have they help? gotten to the Oort cloud yet? Um, so there are, there are, they're essentially, um, in in that sense, in that sense, they're you know no, they're not to that to that. They're not beyond the Oort cloud, but there certainly are the point where the at, at the heliopause where where the the wind and particles from that they're they're picking up that they're picking up more interstellar material from that. The magnetic field that they're experiencing now is a magnetic field of our galaxy more than just our sun. Um, but but there there certainly are still at the point where the where the sun you know there's there's 
there is gravitational attraction, but they're moving mm -hmm. fast enough that the sun won't be able to slow them down and bring them back. Gotcha. Yeah. That question was triggered by some uh, convo in the chat. Yeah, somebody was saying that yeah, it'll be like 300 years before they reach the Oort cloud, and somebody else said, "What? I thought they already left the solar system." Well, that kind of depends on how you define the solar system. Yes, and that's 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 exactly you're you're, you're spot on there. Um, you know, with with the with the Oort cloud right now, the the heavy, if you talk about in terms of of the of of distance, you know, Voyager. You know, Voyager 1 is somewhere, let's say, around 120 AU, somewhere on there. Um, but the Oort cloud is seen to be somewhere between 1,000 AU and 100,000 AU. Um, so, so in some sense, the, the Voyager probes, while they've moved away from the bubble, the, the main particle bubble that is dominant by our sun, um, they have to go at least 10 times farther before they get to the inner edge of what the Oort cloud is. And then another thousand times farther before they get to the outer edge of that, that stuff. So they'll be there for a while. But unfortunately, we won't get them, get data from that because right now the nuclear batteries that are in them are fully decaying, radioactive decay, and they're barely able to produce enough voltage for the transistor transition. It is likely sometime in the next four years, there'll be the sad announcement that the spacecraft is no longer responding because the voltage it's producing is so low that transistors can no longer flip and then it becomes uh, a dead piece of electronics, sadly. Probably was going to happen to um, the rovers too. What is the one that's still going? Um, Curiosity is still going or is that the other one that died? Yeah. I mean, so so in that sense, the New Horizons probe will become the, our next uh, 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 probe that be able to hang out in, in that area. And there are, there are proposals to do high-speed missions, try to get stuff out in there, to understand, but but um, again, from the point of view of where's the edge of the solar system, from the point of view of solar wind, they're beyond that bubble. But in terms of gravitational influence, they're still experiencing a stronger gravitational field from the sun than from other stars, and it won't be do that for another thousand times their distance. Uh, so by the way, Helios noticed that. Um... Well, one of the reasons we had this a little bit later than normal because we were going to do, uh, we were going to wait till after Resurrector had that debate on his channel, which was going to be Astronomy Live. And what, I guess it wasn't a flurfer, I guess it was a space travel denialist who didn't show. And at this point, um, I've long since said, you cannot bother with these people any longer. I don't want to bother with people that think the Earth is flat or space travel denialist or whatever insan insanity these people um, want to you know come with. They've never provided anything. They're for entertainment value only, which is fine. Be entertained by it. I will watch the discussions too. I'll probably have a few here and there. But I got to tell you, for the most part, these flat earthers and space denialists and moon hoax landing deniers and all that stuff, they are a complete, utter waste of time. Take it for what it's worth. It is just pure entertainment. That is it. That's it. They have yeah. no other value except to entertain, make you smile and laugh at them, point at them and go, God damn, there are people that are stupid out there in the world. That's it. That's the whole thing. That's all that's all the whole function they have. Do you do you disagree, Landon? No, not not at all. So, all right. cheers. so but moving on to cheers as well. Um, but at back to the final part of your question, um, I was looking at the the, the calculations and it says that um, yeah, Voyager One will reach the inner edge of our Oort cloud about thirty-one thousand years from now. Wow! In about forty-two thousand years, it'll actually be closer to a star called AC seventy-nine three eight 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 um, than our sun. So, so it's got a way before it, it gets to uh, that. Kawasa asks. Um... I've heard something about the gauge principle could be wrong and things in the cosmos may not be constant. I'm not too familiar with the gauge constant. I know it deals with Lagrangian uh, things, and I know very little about Lagrangian except what it means. Lagrangian, if I remember correctly, is the total total energy of the system minus the potential energy of the system, where the total energy of the system is one-half the summation of all the, kinet all the uh, kinetic energy, which is one-half mv squared. That's Lagrangian for a non- what do they call it? Not a non um, Lorenzian or non. Um, um, oh my God! Special theory of relativity. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, but but so, I don't know what the, I don't I don't I'm not familiar with the gods the gods the gauge principle though. 
but, no but gauge, gauge theory, theory right, but. Is, is a field theory that's which the Grangian actually doesn't change or invariant. It's just invariant. Over, yeah. And so the I mean, but 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 stepping back saying what does it mean? The question becomes um, you know, are fundamental constants constant? And or or are they and are, are they constant over space and time? And it's possible that some of the things that we see are pretty constant very slightly, but they're centered around a spot. It's possible that in extreme conditions, those constants are not constant, but but might change. Yeah. Um, we, we, we don't know. One of the questions that's being asked about these constants are why are they the values that they are? Are there some deeper lying underlying you know, reasons, let's say dealing with geometry and so forth, which causes them to be the value that they are? Are they related to other constants or are they random? Um, uh, we, we, we don't know. So one of the reasons why we start to study very energetic reactions, like in particle accelerators, is to see whether or not the physics of those high temperatures um, matches the physics of, of, of our normal terrestrial experience. Yeah, I mean, if, if, if at high temperature and pressures, especially with that existed immediately following um, the initial phase of the Big Bang, I mean, if, if, if there was a changes in the in the in the things like the fine structure constant or changes in the natural things, I think we would notice it in the cosmic microwave background radiation, though. Yes, yes. So, so it appears to be pretty invariant. Hey, man, Steve knows a few things. <laughs> Salute. Oh, oh yes. I have I have that yes. much scotch. I turn into a you know. <laughs> no, I mean anyone that can um, know about operation of nuclear reactor can't be, and it was allowed to get near it. Can't yeah, they, be they, let, they let me run them. They let me supervise and train people on a 150 megawatt reactor. What does that tell you? Uh, real quick, uh, Justin Oman, $5. Have either of you heard or read the hypothesis titled, quote, an, is an electron a photon with a toroidal topology? It is an interesting read, smiley face. Um, I've, I've seen things where people have tried to relate things like that. I don't buy any of that stuff because to me, electron is a point source. It is a lepton that has uh, no no dimensionality to it. It has zero dimensions. And so when you're trying to relate an electron to a photon, I don't see how a photon has a spin of one electron has a spin of, of one half. Right. Yeah. And so yeah. you're dealing with two yeah. very different particles. I'm in a different, different particles. Oh, my, um, my very first, uh, uh, college final, um, when I had left the university area was electrolytic magnetism and they made me, I, I needed to, to do a calculation using, you know, typically sort of EM calculation, I needed the mass of an electron. And the professor said, what's the mass of an electron? And I said, well, 5 to 11 kilo, kilo electron volts. That is, the, the mass energy equivalent would be a spark gap of 511,000 volts equivalent. And the professor says, well, how do you know that? I said, well, it's generally known. It's accepted. It's what's in. And he said, well, how do you know that? Well, because I read it and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, no, no. How did you, you have you majored it? Uh, no. Okay. Go in the lab, design three experiments, measure the mass electron three different ways, come back and uh, you can answer the question. We're like, but, 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 you know, that, that we're going to, you know, the end of the school year is like in like nine days. So, well, you better get busy. And so I had to go into the lab design three experiments, measure the mass of electron, come back with some answer. And I got, I mean, my error was about 17%, but I said, it's around this. And they said, okay, and that allowed me to proceed because basically they wanted me to um, not just accept standard stuff. They wanted me to test and, and check it. Um, it's one of the things that, that Feynman, Feynman set me up to do that where he he knew that I'd read my mm -hmm. my 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 way that I was quote cheating in 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 classes is I'd read the text the previous year, do all the problems, work all the stuff, and then basically while class is going on, I do other things. Yeah, you might you might remember. <coughs> do you remember the one electron universe? The one electron universe that that is there's only one electron and just different. Yeah, John Wheeler was talking to Richard Feynman on a call, and uh, because Feynman diagrams are are such that you can have one particle mm -hmm. moving forward in time and the antiparticle is yeah. basically moving backwards in time on the diagram. And you know, I is ontologically the case, whatever. But I mean, as a Feynman diagram, obviously that's that's how it actually is interpreted: is one moving plus t and, and the other one going t t minus. But he suggested because of that that 
every electron and every counter electron, the positron, um, is basically the same electron. It's just at a different points in time and space in this huge path. I, I guess you had to use the integral path formula for that. Yeah. Okay. So, but you know, but on the other hand, it's, it's a matter of saying, you know, Feynman diagrams don't dictate where reality is. Yeah. They just, they're just, yeah. Way of describing it. Right. And this is a big thing that had to be drilled into me was, you know, just because you have some model doesn't mean the universe has to pay attention. The yeah. universe has no obligation to consider your model or your theory or your beautiful mathematical structure, right? Your job is to try to interpret what the universe is doing and the universe has no obligation to, to, to your set. So I would, I, and early on I would say, well, but, but blah, blah, blah says, I said, like, no, the universe doesn't care about Yeah, these, that, these, right? these things are not prescriptive. They're descriptive. Yes. Yes. And so, and so the danger with, Feynman diagrams is to assume that is reality when in fact they're a powerful tool to describe reality. I know that's, 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 that's philosophical, but, but it's important. <laughs> sure. No, I agree with that. Um, but yeah, I think, I, I think that is, you know, some of these things are fascinating to think about philosophically speaking, uh, but do they have any real ontology to it? Who the hell knows? Like somebody asked, you know, did like Krauss presuppose the Higgs field? when he wrote a universe from nothing because um, the Higgs field is ubiquitous and there might be, although, I mean, there's suggestions that the Higgs field exists because that wants some parts mass to, to, to matter. But, um, you know, it, it, these are all again, models. Does the universe have to have a Higgs field that actually exists ontologically? Who knows? I, I, well, I couldn't say whether it did or didn't. You know, and, and I say, this is where it's, it's, it's helpful to ask a philosopher. Does the universe have to be explainable? Uh, okay, well, if you, here's the thing. If you subscribe to the principle of sufficient reason, you hold the position that everything has an explanation, right? And I don't particularly hold that everything has an explanation. I think some things are unexplainable. Uh, and, and even to the point, they're probably unexplainable, mostly for a lot of different reasons. Either one, that something's outside of our epistemic reach, or two, or combination, or two, that we are biological agents, and as such, our brains can only process certain things. There are certain things about the universe we are physically limited to have knowledge or understanding of because of the complexity of the universe. So I think between the two, it'd be like asking a, a fish to try to understand quantum mechanics, right? It's just outside yeah. of epistemic limits, biologically speaking. Plus it's forever kind of trapped in its own little universe there. So we might, there might be stuff out there that we just may never know. There might be reasons for things we don't know, but there might be things that just don't have reasons. They're called brute facts. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so, either they're, they're, they're final axioms or you have something like, for example, there's a thing called a continuum hypothesis. Yes, that's and, mathematics. And this is a case where where you say, well, well let's uh, ignoring the details of it. One might assume that mathematics and logic is all powerful. And in fact, that was kind of assumed back in the days of people like, you know, uh, Cantor and so forth in the in the in the, 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 the late 1800s that you could somehow with enough cyber logic stuff derive everything. And, and, and we learned that that's not true. In fact, mathematics has proven that with whatever axiomatic set you, you come up with your result will either be trivial or incomplete or inconsistent. That is, that is you cannot take pure logic and do everything with it and explain everything and, and know the truth of everything. You can't have this magical machine that will tell you the, True stuff that there are statements that are either true or false, but are not provable. So that's a case where some of the purest form of logic itself tells that it's it that it that it's that it's not sufficient for everything. So I I would extend that to the universe and say there are maybe things in the universe that have an explanation, but maybe unexplainable. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Not just that we were just we're not just smart enough fish to understand quantum mechanics. But that, yeah, there's just an explain. Well, I mean, you, you start you, you talk about the continuum, you know, the, the um, continuum hypothesis, right? And you know, you start getting into um, you know cardinalities. You start getting into alf, uh, you know, higher higher cardinality sets. You start getting into all these different things. Whether you you know, does a set of all things contain itself, right? Yeah. Um, was that is it Hilbert's par Hilbert's paradox? Russell's paradox. In, it's Russell's paradox. Russell, Russell, yeah, Russell's Russell. paradox. Um, so you know, the the mind. It's hard. It's hard to comprehend these types of things when you're not just dealing with one infinity. You're dealing with 
multiple types of infinities because there's just not one just type one infinity. Uh, th there are some sets of infinity that are different value, different amounts than other sets of infinities. So you people yeah. think to themselves, okay, look, and I got two sets. This has an infinite amount of elements. This has an infinite amount of elements. They must be equal to each other. No, they don't not be, need to be equal to each other. There could be a distinct difference of elements in this set, more or less than this one, but they'll be considered infinite sets. That's where it starts getting really confusing. Because what happens when you take a, a element out of an infinite set? It still remains infinite. So a Cantor and his ca diagonal proof show that there are higher card uh, car uh, cardinalities of infinite infinites that my brain can't even understand. You know, it's like the uh, continuum hypothesis, the well-ordering principle, and the, what is it, the something lemma? Yeah. Conf confuses the crap out of me. So... So oh, we got a super chat real quick. Let me read the super chat real quick so I get out of the way. Go ahead. All right, sorry about that. Uh, Maximilian Moden, um, you know, I, you know, I want to save this one, Maximilian. So finish all your mathematics first because uh, this is fun. But I will get to your second super check in a second, Moden. I'm going to get back to stepping back to say, well, what does it mean about to the universe? Um, what it means is that while you cannot achieve, I believe it says you can't achieve omniscience and know everything, everything about the universe. On the other hand, you can use reason, observation, and scientific principles to learn an extraordinary amount. Yes, and, and we have not we have not any come even close to scratching one nth of what's possible there. And so the best thing we can say is, I don't know. Let me find out. Like when people ask, is if, it's, if, it, it's, if it is possible to find out, yeah. it, 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 people ask, you know, is warp drive possible? Can you go past the speed of light? I have to say, I don't know. I don't understand the physics would allow that, but I'm not going to say it's impossible um, as an example. That, that, that's probably the best, the most powerful statement you can make is, I don't know, but I'd like to find out. Yeah, I know. I agree with that. Um, tomorrow, we'll be talking about uh, pop, uh, properly basic beliefs, and uh, one of the properly basic beliefs is cause and effect, actually. We, we've never learned. We, we weren't taught cause and effect. We just... By intuit, by, excuse me, by um, induction, we learned cause and effect. But the problem is, is we can never justify that the use of cause and effect because we had to use induction to do it, and yet you can't justify induction. Uh, so uh, a lot of these uh -huh. things, like like cause and effect, we we we, we assume is the case, but we, there's no law in the universe that actually says there has to be a cause and effect. Matter of fact, there's certain things that do not have a cause and effect. But we're going to be talking about the principle of induction and why. Um, you can't justify it like Hume's problem induction. What are properly basic beliefs? What do we think? What do we take as faith based commitments? It's going to be fun tomorrow because I know it's going to trigger atheists because when atheists say, well, we don't have any faith. Well, yeah, you do. Let's explain why tomorrow. It has nothing to do with ontology of God, though. So when people say, well, you know, it doesn't it takes more atheists to be a, uh, more faith to be an atheist than a theist. No, that's a stupid. But when people say, well, atheists don't have faith, that I find to be problematic because every human has faith to some degree. On certain things, so we're going to be talking about that tomorrow for Steve Sunday School. Watch it; it's going to be, it's going to be amazing because I'm telling you that they're going to be going to trigger these people left and right. Um, Maximilian Moden, 200 sex. I have a question that has been struggling. I, I've been struggling lately with lately. A hydrogen atom and an anti-hydrogen atom annihilate on contact. What would happen if a hydrogen and an anti-helium atom made contact, and the extra mass of and the extra mass of the anti-helium? Okay. That's what he's getting at. I, I could okay. try it. I, you go for it first. So, uh, and then so okay. let's, I mean, I, 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 it, it, if you talk about the atoms, probably the most likely is you have a proton and antiproton, the nucleus of atoms, come in contact because mm -hmm. their electron and positron might come in contact as well. Those things will then annihilate and you get to gamma rays at around 5 and 11 kilo electron volts. Why? Because I majored it. Um, <laughs> And I took the test, and I got an answer. No, no, but but the but the two nuclei, when matter and antimatter come together, um, they annihilate each other. You get you get energy. In fact, you know that famous FA equation e equals m c squared. Talking about the mass energy equivalence in a in a frame that's not not in not in motion. Um, that's that's sort of talking about a little bit of mass turns into an enormous amount of energy. Yes. Um, and and by the way, it goes back and forth. Um, so when you take a lot of energy, like two photons come together, you have photons of, of, of enough energy and they interact, you can get matter. Um, one thing, of course, is that, that, that if you don't have, if you have weak photons, like what comes off of these light bulbs, they're not going, they don't, enough, they don't have enough energy to combine and, and turn into particles because you need 
you know, just to get just to get electrons, you need to have fairly energetic gamma rays matching each other to, to create electron positron pair. But here's the odd thing: whenever we see energy turning to matter, it produces equal part matter and equal part antimatter. And this is a problem because if you look out in the universe, you see matter. How do we know that there isn't one of those dots over there behind Steve's head is not antimatter? Well, because if there was antimatter and it would have particles coming off of it, it would interact with matter, you'd see all this gamma radiation coming from the, from the matter and antimatter annihilating each other. Now, I, um, I think the universe is unbalanced, though. I think there actually is something fundamental that uh, has predisposition toward matter over antimatter. I think, and, the, I think and, the symmetry breaks. Yeah. And, and the current models say that that in the early process of the Big Bang, after the Big Bang, about one part in a million um, favored matter or antimatter. There was one million parts matter, 999,999 parts antimatter. That matter and antimatter annihilated, leaving that one part left over. So the question is, why does the universe favor matter over antimatter? Um, why, why is and, why is chirality perform you know right handed over left handed left handed over right handed like we're left handed yes. why 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 are amino acids preferred left handed over right handed and, and so it may be that somewhere in those more energetic states um, there's a slight bias towards one one side um, but but we don't know and that's one of the deep questions that that physics is wrestling with but here again is this is part of science so, so by the way these people are asking great questions. And 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 kudos to you for these people that come in with these wonderful questions. You have, I got you have good. A, I got good people to you watch. You got a great audience. I but, I got a good but, audience. But, but here's really the thing: that science science is about questions. It's not about answers, right? Scientists get really excited when they don't know something because that's the understanding. You don't know something is the is one of the fundamental early steps to gain knowledge. Like they don't know if a proton could uh, free decays in free space. They don't know. Right. They don't know. I mean, th something simple as that. They don't know whether a proton does decay in free space. If it has a half-life. And, and, and so you go on and try to ne do these Neutrons do. Yeah. But but is, is a proton stable? Um, but why? The, there, there are models that suggest that it should be unstable, but there's no application. Yeah, 10 to the negative 30, excuse me, 10 to like 34, 10 to the 31st years or some crap like yeah. that. Okay, but 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 a proton and a neutron are essentially similar. They're just difference in their quark structure. So two down, mm -hmm. one up, instead of two down, uh, two down, one up, instead of two up, one down. But essentially, they're the, they're this very similar particles. Um, so why does it, one, in free space, a neutron will decay after like 3,000 seconds, it doesn't decay um, when it's in a bond condition or a, when it's binded yeah. together. But why is in free space it does, but a proton with a plus charge for some reason doesn't? Scientists don't know this answer to that question. It actually no. was a and, millennium and, and, question. And so, and so people are developing experiments of looking at large chunks of protons and waiting for one of them to decay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and by the way, they just saw a weird decay the other day. Something like a double, double capture, something that's very, very, very oh, rare. Double beta, a double beta, beta decay. Double beta decay, yeah. A uh, very rare event, um, but it, it can happen theoretically, but they'd actually have witnessed one in real time. The, the uh, issue there, and the, and hopefully the measurements will be that, that in the double beta K, the question is what happened to the neutrinos. And here's the case. It is a neutrino its own antiparticle. Can you have, a, can, can, is, can, can the, if it's possible that the neutrino anti neutrino that was, that, you know, that the neutrinos, the two neutrinos that came from the double beta K interact with each other and annihilate each other, or you had two neutrinos. Yeah. That is, is a neutrino its own antiparticle? Or, because in a double beta K, you should have had two neutrinos created. Did those neutrinos in close proximity annihilate each other and give you off a photon, or did you get two, two neutrinos flying out? Yeah. That's one of the things that they're hoping for those rare and, double beta and, and, and it is kind of cool that matter and antimatter, when they do combine, they, they eliminate each other completely. It's a 100% it's a, it's a conversion. <laughs> Poof, yes. they're gone. Um, but in, like, for example, they're talking about a helium atom. A helium atom, when you have uh, HE, you have two protons and two uh, uh, neutro neutrons. And so you have four actual um, nucleons in that, in that structure, but you have two protons. And they're both plus charge, right? So people, yes. have, people have asked before, how do you have four nu nucleons, two of them are the plus two charge, and it doesn't repel each other, right? And there's a fascinating answer to that. Nuclear force. 
Yes, the strong nuclear force. And this is this is a fascinating answer to that the, the, the particular question. It hasn't been asked tonight, but people have asked it before. And my favorite answer is that the strong nuclear force is what holds these these quarks together inside the neutrino, assuming mean, inside the nucleon. And so when you have that strong nuclear force, the weird thing about it, it has a very, very limited range, but the range is just enough to go beyond the boundaries of that nucleon. And so the strong nuclear force is greater than the electrostatic repulsive force of the two protons. And so because the protons are in such close proximity to each other, the strong nuclear force between that and the, and the neutrons is great enough, just great enough, to overcome the repulsive force. So it keeps it all together. Now what happens when you split that atom is you're releasing that extra energy. And that energy is converted, um, it, the, the, that mass defect is converted into energy because if you add if, what happens is actually. Okay, I wonder what you mean when you combine. If you take when two, combined, you have a mass defect. Yeah. So if, yes. if, if you if you add the individual weights of neutrons together and the individual weights of protons together, this is this is this for numbers. Let's say like one is one and one is one point one or something. So let's yeah. say you get two point two. That's what they would be rated individually. Or four point four point two would be individually. Okay, but when you put them together, they only weigh four. You're missing point two. Now again, rough numbers. It's not correct, yep. but but it, the point is that you're missing mass, it's, and that's things people think that's weird because if you have four basketballs and you put four basketballs together, they weigh the same. That doesn't work on the subatomic level. When you put them no. together, they have a mass defect because that mass is is actually the the energy is being held in that strong nuclear force to keep that nucleus together. That's when they split the atom. That's what's being released. That's the energy we get out of it. That's the kinetic energy that goes off in the fission fragments that, that hit the water molecules that heat it up that we use to generate electricity for a nuclear reactor there you go now you're all so, well versed so, in nuclear physics so, because again what, what, what steve is saying is those positive charges in the nuclei um are are, are held together against the normal repulsion of, of positive charges um because the strong nuclear force in in the round strong the nuclei is stronger yep, than guy. the electromagnetic propulsion that wants to climb fly apart so when you take a large atom like uranium or plutonium and you split it into two chunks you all of a sudden have these two positive charged particles very close to each other. And if you've ever taken magnets and the, uh, the same polarity and try to push them together, they really, as you get closer and closer, the, the forces get extremely strong. The same thing happens with those that, that atom you split and those two chunks are next to each other. They then repel each other like crazy and fly off at enormous speeds, creating energy. So that's, that's the basically the 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 principles of of a reactor yeah you want you want those fission fragments because you're going to have decay products you you, you, you rain three the five is going to split apart you're going to have things like promethium to technetium samarium uh xenon you got all these different things that can be produced those particles when they're produced are very 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 uh, energetic fission fragments and so when when they first come out of that that um, splitting of the atom they're going to be vibrating they're going to have kinetic energy well what does kinetic energy vibration do it makes heat because it yep. it interacts with the water molecules. That's what heats up the water. That water goes then to um, it's under pressure, so it doesn't turn into steam. That then goes to a steam generator. The steam generator then converts it to a secondary source, which is the water that's going to be actually used to be turned into steam, and that's going to turn your turbines. So we like having two very powerful magnets next to each other that are, that are that are the same polarity, and they and the planets fly apart. And, and you give it just enough apart. energy. You just hit something with it, so they fly apart. Right. Yep. So I mean, like, yeah, and 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 the speed of that that of that chunk starts bouncing off of things, right? As it's as it's as it's slowing down, and that that extra momentum hitting water molecules causes water to heat up, mm -hmm. or sodium, whatever your your reactor material is, and you use that hot stuff to generate steam. You use steam to generate electricity and. There you go. Yeah, I now, mean, there's other things involved too. Yes, obviously, as people talk about, there's gamma rays and some other ways that they produce too. But the main source of, of heat is from the actual fission fragments, kinetic energy, and then the the main there's two sources of your neutrons. Your main source of neutron is going to be from your primary source, and then you're going to have what's called delayed neutron precursors that are produced later on. That are going to have neutrons produced later on through those decayed fission fragments. That slows down your over kind of overall. Uh, reactor reactive what's called reactivity addition rate so if it wasn't for that if, if, you know it's funny Landon, if it wasn't for these weird things in physics like the fact that when you produce um, a fission two fissions and you have these delayed neutron precursors that are going to eventually produce a neutron but don't do it right off the path they're not source neutrons if it wasn't for that fact nuclear reactors wouldn't work well it would it'd probably be worse 
Chicago wouldn't wouldn't be there anymore because if they had built the Fermi carbon the, the, pile, the, the, the Chicago pile. Yeah. In Chicago, time. that would have if it didn't have to lay neutrons, yeah. that would have exponentially gone off the curve and gone boom, and you wouldn't have it in Chicago anymore. Yeah, I mean, no. so so the fact that that the fact that physics works the way it is, where you can actually utilize it for reactor, I, I still I think it's amazing, right? I mean, that we are able to harness something merely because the rules of physics are such that allow for that. Because if it wasn't for those things, we could not have nuclear power; it just would not work. It would be it would be an no. atomic bomb. And, and and by the way, you know, so 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 in terms of of large atoms become unstable and will even decay, you know, check out, you know, throw out chunks of, of itself, like alpha particles, basically a pair of protons and neutrons, or will kick out, you know, positrons or electrons or, or in a beta decay or, or protons or neutrons. That, that, that's so big, big atoms will become unstable and will, will throw off chunks in, in certain forms mm -hmm. or will split into pieces. Spontaneous fission. Yeah. And so, but, but small nuclei, um, like, Two protons can, if you if you get enough force, can over and to for they overcome their their repulsion, can can stick together and form deuterium. And it's interesting that when you take small chunks and bring them together, you get energy release. Yep. Where you take large chunks and split them, you get energy release. Somewhere in between is the spot where they kind of balance out. So that fusion, things coming together, small particles coming together, produces energy that's why the sun doesn't collapse under its own gravitational weight because you've got hydrogen converting into helium inside the core that's that's pushing it out and gravity pushing it in it's interesting by the way interesting enough that that if you if you took you look at the temperature and density inside the sun's core of of these positively charged particles flying around it's not enough just in pure kinetic processes to fuse what actually happens is when you get like two deuterium atoms near each other, they actually quantum tunnel across their repulsive barrier and fuse. And so inside the sun, you have quantum mechanics also going on where, where what would normally be a, a impenetrable barrier of charge, mm -hmm. the things jump across and, and, and fuse together. That's how, and that's so, how a diode works. <laughs> yes. And so it's, it's like, it's, it's again, it's that weird bit of quantum mechanics and weird bit of relativity and nuclear stuff. Yeah, di oh. yeah, exactly. We already have radio if it wasn't for that. Yes. At least modern radio. I mean, we'd have a spark cap but, transmitter or something. Had, but. But, but we did have a question, which was, what happens if you have an anti-proton and, a, and a, say, a helium atom or an anti-helium and, and a proton? What would happen, I believe, is that the, the proton would, or the antiparticle, let's say the antiproton, would, if it got hold, connected to a helium, would essentially annihilate one of the nucleons in the helium in the helium nucleus. It would create a huge ball of energy, which would which would cause the remaining three nucleons to be ejected yeah. with, with great force. Yeah, and probably um, it would probably split them into three. I mean, it'd probably be free particles, but it'd be a lot of energy released. Yeah, and that's a that's an interesting question. I'd have to do the calculation. Do the model. Yeah, model. Would it, it would it end up going and and splitting the uh, uh, the helium nuclei, or would it? Would it eject a a uh, helium three nucleus or a or a hydrogen? There you go. You got to look up. I don't know. I'll have to think about that. That's a good question. But the answer is 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 that that only like only equal amounts of matter and antimatter matter interact. Right. Um, Fifty fifty. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, that that the point on that what's called a fission yield curve, um, the point where you start losing the um, you start going from combining to get energy to um, uh, separated to get energy. Yeah, yeah, so that's about where iron is. Um, and so like iron, that doesn't fuse. You don't get any energy out of it. It takes more energy to fuse iron than to put into it. So what happens is when a star starts going through its life cycle, it starts off with helium, hydrogen, then it starts going through what's called carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen cycles, depending on the star. But CNO, but it also has like lithium and beryllium. So you have hydrogen and helium, lithium, beryllium. Then it starts going into higher stuff like the carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, and then it starts producing iron. Once well, it starts, so you, 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 you silicon, get, you get, you get silicon and other yeah, things. Under, neon, but, yeah, neon. I mean, yeah, nitrogen. Yeah. Yeah, those are the yeah, things produced. But eventually, you, you'll you eventually end up with iron. And once you end up with iron, that star is doomed. Yeah, because so so back to say Bilgis and the thing that that's next to his ear over there. That star, when when it when it runs out of being able to fuse super iron silicon, silicon to to you know, and it has to start fusing iron. Iron will fuse, but the problem is that it. It, that that by the time you get to fusing iron, you have it takes more energy yeah. 
to fuse than it produces. So now so you're, it, now you're it, screwed. It's a, net, it's a net energy sink. So the core starts cooling, which means, and again, what's a star? The star is this core explosion pushing out and gravity pushing into the balance point. Gamma ray, pressure versus, sudden, uh, gamma ray pressure versus gravity. Yeah. And if all of a sudden your core is, is, is cooling and absorbing and contracting, then gravity wins and the star rushes in on itself at, at, and achieves a good fraction of the speed of light before it crushes it on itself and does this spectacular thing. You get all kinds of crazy stuff about neutrin, neutrin, so it's bouncing, you know, neutrin bounces and, and, yeah. and, and, and atoms smashing each other and, and black hole forming and all kinds of crazy stuff happen, which is why we want Bayou Geese to do it, do its thing so we can watch it. Awesome. it. But but alas, oh, so we, again, we, we observe dozens of these happening in this visible universe um, each year, and we're getting better at detecting them. We just like one really close so that we can get some of the more subtle effects and learn more about physics. Okay. Um, so Helios asks again, $5, he says, have we been able to witness particle decay? I thought that the quantum Zeno effect has prevented us from being able to directly observe quantum decay. quantum decay so is he talking about um the fact that we haven't determined we have not um so we so yes i i think we have not de definitely detected I, I, I think it's because of how, yeah i think it's because of the observation itself of the waveform or the wave function is he's talking about um because it, it goes into uh, when does the rep i think it goes in when and i don't quote me on this but i think it goes in when the waveform wave function collapses or does not collapse because there's certain theories in uh -huh. quantum mechanics the wave function collapses in other ones it doesn't collapse and in other theories there's only one wave function and that's the universe like for, for pilot wave theory there's one 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 wave function so mm -hmm. the quantum measure the measurement problem is when does that wave function actually collapse and when is the observation of that quantum mechanical system that you're observing does it have the collapsing of the wave function and um I, I think the Zeno effect, if I remember correctly, is something along the lines of, of how the, how the observation of the affects the wave function. But I'm I'm not I'm going to look it up here in a second. So one sec. <laughs> Oops. So. But the answer is is if you get if you get more matter than antimatter or more ma antimatter than matter, only the equal bits of matter antimatter and not each other, and the rest of the stuff gets unhappy because they got all this energy produced nearby that creates. Kind of yeah, it's close. I mean, it has to do with the measurement problems and the wave function of the eigenstates, and uh, that's complicated stuff. But I, I guess don't know. <laughs> but it comes from it, does, it comes from Zeno's arrow, uh, arrow's paradox. So Zeno's Zeno's arrow paradox is basically the fact that if you shoot an arrow, um, does it ever if you if you watch it, does it actually ever hit the wall? Because at any time it has to go one half its distance. So the summation of one half plus one quarter plus one eighth plus one sixteenth plus one thirty two is the summation of that is equal to one because the limit of a, of a sequence is going to be the, the sum of yeah. the sequence is going to be the, the limit of the series. Or sorry, the, yeah. uh, the limit of the sequence is going to be the sum of the series. So if you take all the add-ins for one half, one fourth, one eighth, you're going to get one. But what happens at each point? At one point, your the arrow's one half the distance. Another time two, the arrow's one um the uh, one half plus one fourth, then it's one half plus one fourth plus one eighth, and then one plus one sixth, and you keep adding that, but you never mathematically you never get to to infinity really. But 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 here but, in reality, one of the things that happens about that arrow on the target is you're you're at some point unable to take measurements fine enough, with enough precision, enough fast enough to see what happens. But it still hits. Right. It still moreover, eventually hits. Moreover. The, the notion that there's a hard edge target and a hard edge point to the tip is quantum mechanically invalid, right? That that you, what you really have is a wobbly, wiggly surface with fields of, of particles that are somewhere in that probability cloud. You get this other probability cloud of the, of the arrowhead coming in and the two clouds start to merge and you got to get electrostatic forces and things go further. So when you talk about the act of arrow hitting the target, you have a bunch of fuzzy stuff hitting a bunch of fuzzy stuff with a bunch of fuzzy interactions. Right. No, on. I agree with that. But but uh, and your paradox, ability to even measure it is is, is limited. But so, Zeno's paradox was that it shouldn't actually ever hit. It should get closer and closer and closer and never actually hit it because you never hit infinity. But we know by now we know because of mathematics now that when you do have an infinite series like that, which would would be uh, yeah. one half comma one quarter comma one eighth comma, that's your series, a sequence. 
Um, and then your your I, I hate the different series series would be one half plus one quarter plus one eighth sequence would be one quarter comma one quarter comma you know that's well I mean you're yeah, adding them together three, whatever three quarters yeah. seven eighths yeah, yeah. So whatever the, whatever the sequence would be uh, same yeah. thing like people's pointed out point nine nine equals one same thing your sequence is point nine comma point nine nine comma point nine 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 comma point nine 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 comma that's your sequence but your series is one over um, point uh, 9 plus 1 over 0 0.09 plus 1 over 0 0.009. That's your sequence. Then you're adding all those together, and then it's eventually going to e equal 1 because the, the sum of all that is equal to 1. See, I remember a little bit. And so, but, but, but if you if, if you were to be so unfortunate as to doubt this process and had an archer shoot an arrow at you, you would find the error of your ways. Really <laughs> yeah. quick. Well, that's, that's like you said. Um, you know, these models have no... They have no no need to actually be what reality is, right? I mean, we may have some kind of thing mathematically where we could say, "Hey, look, here's one basketball using the Tarski paradox. Here's two basketballs." Doesn't mean reality is going to work that way. Yeah, and so, but but models are useful because you can help them. It helps you explain, particularly mathematical models, where you're, you're not encumbered by the imprecision of language. So we use models because they're very useful in trying to trying to describe certain phenomenon. But we never, if, if we're being scientifically correct, confuse a model with reality. We just, and, and we recognize that our model might have limitations. So when you use Newtonian mechanics and modeling Newtonian mechanics, and you talk about, you know, guns and bullets and explosions and, and shrapnel sort of thing, that's all Newtonian mechanics. Um, even though there's a more precise model in, in relativistic space, in Einsteinian um, uh, space, the model of Newtonian mechanics is pretty good in understanding how cars work, how planes work, um, how bicycles work, all that sort of stuff. So the model doesn't have to be true in order to be useful. Just like an analogy can be informative, just don't confuse analogy with reality. Yeah. Um, somebody, uh, Ian Charity wants you to talk about Mel Nelson Mandela. Another night for that, I think. Um, nice, a very nice person, an amazing individual. Um, and it is one of those, he's one of those people that, you know, there will be, uh, unfortunately a long time before someone of his stature, um, uh, rises again. I, I fear. I think uh, Nicholas Suter had an interview with Nelson Mandela at one time. Uh, somebody also wants to know about Max T Tegmark's mathematical universe hypothesis. I know absolutely nothing about it. Never heard it before. By the way, I was going to say about another fact about Nelson Mandela. Um, I believe he had a, a, a near photographic memory, right? People could tell him something and he'd remember it with great detail. Uh, so in that, in that first meeting where I met him, you know, uh, in, in person, someone had in the last hour or two mentioned who I was so he could walk in the room and talk to me about relevant stuff. He didn't have to be briefed. He didn't have to have cue cards. He didn't have to have a little teleprompter. He just, you know, knew. So, um, he had a lot going on up upstairs and, uh, and it's, it, I, I, I hope that South Africa lives up to his ideals. Yeah, um, we're, we're gonna we're gonna, these days, we're gonna have a whole segment on that. I think. Cause I think I, I think um, like I said, uh, Nick suited an interview with him one time. Um, but all right. So anybody else in the uh, here, like James, uh, my finished journey, so but you guys got anything you want to add? Uh, I've had a question that I've, that I've been done to ask. Please. Um, why do stars, as they age and run out of hydrogen and helium, why do they like? start expanding and cooling down excellent question um the the model says that for example a star starts fusing hydrogen producing helium and that has a certain temperature and a certain reaction rate when it runs out of hydrogen in its core like it gets depleted then it starts this reaction starts slowing down so we think in fact the star might be dimming and that point the gravity starts saying, hey, I'm, the gravity is still there. The mass is still there. So it starts crushing the star in and it starts shrinking a bit. The pressure builds up inside the core. That, that higher pressure, higher temperature then starts to allow helium to fuse. Helium fuses, you get more energy out of its reaction. 
And the result is that that star starts to contract. All of a sudden, you get a more energetic reaction and it starts to, to, to expand, right? Because of the more energetic fusion reaction going on with helium. And the result is that that, that shock wave hits the outer edges. Um, the star will swallow up, but the outer edges that are tinted, that, that are sort of uh, loosely bound to the, to the mass, get a shock wave and they blow off. And so we think what happens is that when the star goes from hydrogen to helium burn, you know, fusing, you get it, the outer edge gets blown off. In some cases, a large chunk of the outer edge, you know, large part of the outer mantle of the star blows off. In other cases, just a little bit, depends on how fast it, it flips over. And, and we can see that because we look at the, the, the stars we can see are now fusing helium. And, and we look at the things with radio waves, we find that there's a shock wave around the star the shockwave around the star that's expanding that cause from the from the star blowing off its outer layers when that that more energetic system occurs now it's true that that the star is is more energetic but also that energy pushes against the hydrogen and causes the star to expand quite a bit and, and the ironic thing is that even though the star is is producing more light you know more light because it's it's a much bigger surface area the star appears to be cooler. That is, that is first, you have, you have more energy, but you have much more surface area. The result is it appears to be cooler for sur surface area. So the star actually appears to be reddened. Yeah, reddened. and um, Mandelbrot said you get less energy from helium. I thought that's the case too. I thought uh, proton, proton, and deuterium burning uh, is going to be high, higher energetically speaking if you look at the electro uh, electro uh, volts as opposed to the amount of energy produced from helium i could be wrong on that but i thought that that it was proton proton cycles the deuterium burning um and then you have helium and then lithium uh, mebrillium uh and then each time you you get more you get less and less out out of it i thought that the the tritium deuterium uh, deuterium and uh proton proton cycle is the most amount of energy for bang for your buck now there's a curve that rises in terms of the amount of energy you get but in terms of of volume in a, in a star core you're getting a more energetic reaction that'll burn because one of the things is that that it's easier for helium to fuse inside of a core with sufficient temperature and pressure so no, hang on red red your, your mic is just killing me girl i love you to death but that i cannot take that popping noise it just kills my ears I love you, but I can't deal with that popping noise. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. So, 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 so the, so the, so per unit volume of a of a star fusing helium, you get more energy producing, even okay. though individual individual reactions might be less. The, the 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 speed and the and the and the and the the speed and the pressures of a helium fusing core produces energy at a higher rate than a hydrogen. Okay, fusing. so it's so it's okay, so um, it's less electro. Uh, volts per per event but it's a higher reaction rate yes okay i can do that you know so if i if i if i misled somebody i apologize because um but but yes um and that's it turns out when you get to the point of silicon fusing and start produce, fusing high iron um you know those happens probably very very quickly so you might go through 10 billion years of hydrogen fusing a couple hundred million years of helium fusing and maybe a few million years of carbon fusing, a few thousand years of silicon, and it just it's just exponentially goes faster and faster. But when 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 you know, the silicon fusing phases happen very rapidly in the in the core, you start getting iron. Iron starts absorbing energy, and it's all over. The star collapses, and you get really amazing stuff. I mean, yeah, uh, YouTube Surgeon General says that, yeah, our star can never be a black hole, which, is, by the way, we're, we're, we won't be around for that anyways, but this our star is too small to be a black hole. Um, it's just not that big of a star. Uh, you would have to take our star and you'd have to literally condense it down, compactify it into a, a radius of about 2.95 kilometers. Yeah. That's really small, and so it just doesn't have the, the ability I mean, I to do that. Stars that are bigger than our sun, a lot bigger than our sun, can produce uh things and it, on, it but it also depends on how it collapses because it can produce something called a neutron star which is other weird forms of matter um in 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 that but presumably something like you know betelgeuse again this is about betelgeuse if it if it went through a type 2 supernovae most likely it would produce a black hole um but it would blow off a lot of its mass right 
a lot of mass was converted. There's a non-trivial amount of mass was converted to new, new, neutrinos, these subatomic particles that are also quite weird. Um, it would blow off a lot of material, um, but a good chunk of it would end up, you'd probably get one or two or three solar masses of material crushed at a density so so significant that that the escape velocity would be greater than the speed of light and you get a black hole event horizon and weird things happen. Yeah, our sun would probably be a white white dwarf. Yeah. Shen, so we Shen, Shen just our limit. I mean you need somewhere around maybe eight solar masses to have a really good chance of forming a black hole. Uh, um and we just don't have seven stars to add to our, our star before it would do that. Yeah. Uh I'll ask do you know do you know anything about interesting about Titari stars? Do I know anything about T? The variable type stars, Titari. Well, variable stars. Um, so there are different types of variable stars. But why would a star vary? One of the things is that you can get um, cycling pulsing rates, where, for example, the the core gets start to get inter, somewhat more energetic. It expands. That expansion causes the cool, which causes the fusion rate to slow down, which causes gravity to start to crush down, and the Gravity crushing it increases pressure and temperature where the fusion rate goes up again. So you get this bouncing back and forth between, you know, um, blow out, slow down, crush, speed up. That that piece mm -hmm. pulsing process um, is physically tied to, let's say, the mass of the star. And one of the things that's interesting is that there are certain types of variable stars that the the speed at which it varies is a directly a function of its mass, and it's very directly a function of its brightness. So there are types of stars we can that, that have this variability between it it starts to it starts to expand, cool, shrink, get dim, gravity tries to crush it in, it begins to, to heat up, become brighter, expand back and forth, back and forth. That the, the, that pulsing of the star, that variability of the star, it, of the certain stars are a directly a function of how bright they are. That's really important in terms of measuring distances to to nearby objects because if we can see one of those pulsing stars and and see how fast it goes back and forth between maximum and minimum brightness you know how much material is in that star how energetic it is how actually absolutely bright it is so why is that important well let's say you could effectively say this star is a hundred watt light bulb but when i measure it it looks like one watt well, the reason why it looks like one watt is that 100 light white light bulb that may across the room, if it's 10 times farther, will look only like, like a one light bulb, one watt light bulb because of inverse square law. So when we take a standard CFID variable, there's a very classic star that exhibits this pulsing behavior in the constellation of Cepheus, where we that's close enough we can actually see it wobble back and forth as the Earth goes from this side of the sun to that side of the sun. That that allowed us to calibrate how how far that star was. We can actually directly measure it. We can actually also know how fast it's pulsing. So we see another star in a nearby galaxy that's pulsing at the same rate, but it's much fainter. We know it's a 100-watt bulb, but it appears to be only one, um, let's say, 100th of a watt. The reason why is because that star is 100 times farther away. So we can measure the actual distance of the star because we know how bright it should be, but versus how far bright it appears to be. So bright stars that are far away are dim. And if you know how bright they are intrinsically and you measure how bright they appear to be, you know how far they are. And that's one of the standard ways that we do to begin to measure um, distances from these nearby galaxies because we can actually observe <clears throat> individual stars in nearby galaxies with telescopes that are good enough. We can find the ones that are pulsating and therefore determine their distance. Yeah, somebody asked why doesn't it reach equilibrium, and I think that's because of the difference between when you have proton-proton conversion cycles going on, you have, then you have things going into lithium, and you have things in beryllium. And this is, uh, by the way, taking different, happening in different times of the star, too. Yeah. It doesn't automatically, all of a sudden, boom, all of this being converted into helium. So you're never going to have a true balance, and, but it is a, an overall net balance of this gamma ray pressure that's being exerted from the core of the star and gravity. Uh, that's pushing down on it so it's a constant battle it's just it's one's always gonna be a little it's gonna go back and forth it's gonna also the fusion cores are very turbulent so it's yeah, not a matter very turbulent of just, you get pure helium hydrogen fusing all of a sudden it turns to helium you get you get 
all this turbulence process is going on. So it's actually kind of a mixture and it kind of goes a transition, but, but there is a point which, which there is not enough hydrogen in the sun's core left for it to do much fusing. The star begins to collapse and then um, helium starts fusing. The result is a, a faster reaction producing more energy per, 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 per star volume. The result is the star he, heats up. Our sun's gonna do that in approximately 6 billion years. Um, it will start, it'll be growing gradually brighter, but at some point it's going to shrink and go dim a little bit. And that point helium will start become the dominant fusing process and our sun will swell up. It'll swell up to the point where it'll get close to, but maybe not quite to earth's, um, uh, orbital size. All right, one last thing, and then we'll get Mike in here. So somebody wants to know if silicon-based life forms are possible. Yes, yes, why not? I don't I don't see why not. <laughs> They're possible, though, although carbon is such a rich, has a rich, rich chemical compounds. It would seem to be um, the dominant one. It would take over anything. But... Or when you look, when you look at, you look at the, the, the composition of the universe, right? Uh, number one is hydrogen. Number two is helium, but that's inert gas. And then you get, you know, carbon, oxygen, or are, are nitrogen, are in the next set of things. Um, carbon is much more common than silicon. Yeah. Part of the process is that, 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 that silicon only gets formed in those larger massive stars that are in more extreme conditions. Organic chemistry is all carbon based. <laughs> and, and the reason why is because carbon is a really, has a really great way of, of, of all the periodic table, carbon can do the most dancing with all kinds of other uh, chemicals to do really wacky, amazing, fun things. If anyone that takes organic chemistry. Can, can just a, I mean, just look at the way carbon can be arranged. You have diamond, buckyballs, uh, graphite. Yeah. You know. And so these carbon bonds, carbon and hydrogen bonds, and that's another one there. You know, it, 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 it. There's no doubt. You know why carbon is favored because physics favors it. Yes, it's technically possible you get silicon forms, but but it's very it the silicon. Um, it would be much harder to get interesting chemical reactions with silicon. Especially because it's carbon lying around doing, you know, able to do it much, much easier. Right. So technically silicon life forms are possible, but I think it's more likely just given physics that, 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 and then carbon is much more plentiful than, than silicon in the universe that you get carbon stuff. Now what carbon does doesn't necessarily mean it's identical to what happens on earth because carbon has all kinds of wacky things that can do how carbon, nitrogen and oxygen and hydrogen. Get together and form all kinds of things. They have, they have a pretty interesting chemical party when they. When all they right. Well, let's get uh, Mike in here real quick because I gotta gotta get going here in probably less than uh, seven minutes. So yeah, uh, it's getting get late. As well. Yes. Uh, not with me, I hope. Steve. Right. <laughs> no, no, not tonight. I'm not. Uh, I'm not hurt Steve. by this. By the way, I'm not hurt by this. <laughs> hello, hello. Hey, and buddy. Greetings. <laughs> and the other thing on the silicate life forms, it's like uh, the bonds for silica are just so much stronger than carbon that if something was able to be made it would live like a million years it would it'd be pretty hardy right it also would not have the the the, the variability because one of the things that happens with with carbon is because you can have it's, it's not only just forming the chemical but it's the chemical reactions that right are, right right for life where where silicon actions they kind of stick around and say no I like this 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 state I'm in don't bother me right. I'm good I'm good where I'm at <laughs> yes yes and so I'm not saying that the silicon life forms aren't impossible I'm just saying if you have a bunch of silicon a bunch of bunch of carbon most likely the carbon's going to have a much more fun party right if you want to yeah. have a party party with carbon because it's it's got all kinds of things going it loves to interact. It, um, it, it, it does, and it, it <laughs> dances, and it forms bonds, and it, it goes back and forth, and the molecules all flock around and do all kinds of crazy stuff, all these protein things. Um, much more than, let's say, than silicon can do. Um, right. And there's a lot more carbon, so it's more right. common, and it's, it's more fun at parties. Um, my question was, I, don't, I missed the correct pronunciation, but I'm going to say Beetlejuice because I'm going to, in, in my house, it's the third time saying it, and I'm waiting for Michael Keaton to show up somewhere. There you go. <laughs> um, so, so Beetlejuice is a red supergiant? Yes. Okay. So, according to physics, what color can a star not be? Well, you don't see green stars. And that makes me sad. 
And it makes me sad too. But but here's why: because a star is actually not one color. It's a it's a whole distribution of colors. You have these sort of these black body radiations. And so when you have a very cold star, and there are stars that are only a couple hundred degrees Kelvin that we've discovered, um, they only grow in the very, very far infrared. But when you get more energetic, when the star gets hotter and hotter, you get more energetic photons coming off. Then it, when they become... Like visible, a brown dwarf? Yeah, you get like room temperature. brown to very, very red, right? And now you get, a, you get, the, you get this, this spectrum of, of stuff called the black body curve. Um, you get a little bit of red, and you get more energetic. Now you get a bit more red and a little bit of orange. So they start going from deep red to kind of reddish orange. And then you get more energetic. You get a, uh, a bunch of red, <clears throat> some orange, and a little bit of yellow. And by the time you get being farther, now all the stuff starts where you start to get um, little greens and blues. Now they start looking white. All those colors blend together, and you see white. Now our sun is not a yellow star. It's a it's it it produces white light why because you look at a white spectrum it'll it'll it you know a, a sheet it'll actually reflect white not yellow right um so the reason why and now if you keep that star going hotter and hotter and hotter where its peak moves through the spectrum where it starts to get greens and blues in it now you have all the colors of the spectrum you see white as you shift it well beyond where it starts getting lots of ultraviolet and the red starts dimming because it's moved off of there. Now you get sort of things that are sort of bluish stars. So Rigel, the other side of the box of Orion from, from, from Betelgeuse is a blue star because its temperature is so high that it's mostly purple, blue, a little bit of green, a little bit of, of yellow. Going farther and farther and farther, you'll get to very, very, very deep blues and purples, but you'll never get a star that has so narrow band that you see purely green and that's sad yeah I yeah i would it. say i would say that there's a, the color that no star can be is pink because pink doesn't exist because pink doesn't have a corresponding wavelength to it but I, then you could argue that no colors exist because i'm a color realist and it's all phenomenon in your brain anyways but but that's that's the reason why you don't stop the star you see you see red stuff because they're the ones that the peaks are below most of the below the the little spectrum and you get a little bit of red through you see white because they're kind of spread throughout the whole of the octave mm. of color and you see blue because now they're they're so energetic that you only you only the little tail of stuff you get to a little bit of blues and 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 um and a little bit of yellows there you so go. It's kind of sad. now one of the things by the way is that, that in our sky we tend to favor the reds over the blues the reason why is that blue um blue is the color of the sky why is the color why is the sky blue riley scrally uh, scattering a scattering, really scattering, right? When you when you go out in the daytime and see this night pretty blue sky, you're seeing the surface of the sun because it's the blue photons coming off the sun that hit our oxygen and nitrogen or our, our cloud and scatter around and create this fog. Mm -hmm. So that, that nice blue, brilliant sky is actually coming from the sun. It's, it's it, we're lucky the sun isn't very strong and blue because it'd be really bright outside. Um, so the blue sky is because of that. So at night, by the way, the, the sky is still blue. It's just mm -hmm. dark. You don't see it. I mean, the stars that are shining, the light from the stars shining through will still make the sky blue. It's just so dark we consider it black. But what it means is that, that the, the stars that are blue are dimmed somewhat because their light is diffused through our atmosphere. Well, same thing when, when you see a shooting star that's bright enough, it'll make the sky blue. Yeah. Well, I've seen that happen. It's really cool, actually. And when you, if you see a total solar eclipse and you're not, you're not light blinded by the, by the things like diamond ring and look around there, you can see all this blue sky there, even though the, uh, the sun is covered. That was one of the craziest things that I've ever experienced in my life. And I am officially addicted to eclipses. Is it, aren't eclipses amazing? Folks. The, the birds stop chirping. <sighs> the, the, the crickets shut up. They, they say it's a spiritual <laughs> experience. Is, is, yeah. Any flowers closing? If you if you if you were nearby and you saw flowers, they would go through their nighttime thing and, and close up. I was I was in a small town, and I guess the the um, the only comparison would be the um, the street lights came on. Yeah, because it, it, it gets it gets it gets dark. It got, also, it got dark, also, dark. Did you also notice the temperature change? Uh, I noticed it probably about three minutes before totality, and then a lot during, and then it 
got because I was down in um, oh. down in Missouri, and it was about ninety eight degrees that day. But then once that, like about three minutes before and then about three minutes after, it was, it felt like a good, you know, like 75 and sunny. Yeah, like it, was, yeah. it just felt brilliant. And then it, it just got right back to muggy and disgusting. Because what you saw was a sun setting. You saw a sunset, but the sun was up in the sky. Yeah. Right? And so, and so you want to say, well, what's it like? Well, wait till sunset and start cool. That's, that's what you experience. Did you also notice the wind changing? Uh, it wasn't windy that day, so but there, we didn't have because you because you, 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 you have a different pressure. You have wind blowing in, right? A different temperature because so, so the temperature drops. That, that lunar shadow, oh, cold, yeah, cold, cold zone. You you experience the coldness of that. What does cold air do? It sinks. Right. So in that shadow, you had a column of, of air cooling and coming down on the off the earth, and then and then like it's like pouring cold water. Isn't that cool as hell? <laughs> and it moves in all directions. So right. if you were to watch and you, and you take, pay attention to the, and again, it's hard because there's all this stuff going on at the same time. It's hard yeah. to concentrate. But if you were to, if you were to, you might have been able to notice that in the direction that the shadow is coming from, you would start to feel a breeze. And as it got, the shadow got closer, as it got closer to that totality, Part of the problem is he got all this stuffs going on in the sky, and you get you get distracted. Yeah, we were staring into the the the, the, the lenses and the scope. We were so it's, entranced. It's, it's it's a lot of stuff going on there. But but you might have noticed that Arena noticed that that the wind was coming from the direction that the shadow is coming towards you. If you do, mm. if you look off on it, because one of the things to, to decide to do, and another eclipse is rather than watch the diamond ring, watch the shadow coming. Oh at, yeah. Towards you, because you you see off in the distance of uh, uh, this sort of this dark band. It starts this small dark band, but as it gets bigger and bigger, it becomes larger and larger. And you see this 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 large cone of darkness rushing towards you at about Mach two, getting bigger, 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 That's and then you start cool. feeling the, the the wind coming from it. And then when when totality hits the cone, you're developed in that cone. And guess where the direction of the wind comes from? It's from up above. So you, you, you feel this wind breathe coming off of the cone as it's coming towards you. But once it right. lands on you, it right. goes silent. So, so part of that, that, that thing you heard about those, those birds and so forth, right. you, were in a, you were in a cone of silence of air gently wafting down on you. And so by the way, if you, if you then go to the other side and now the, the eclipse leaves, and you watch this. You can watch the shadow racing away from you in the other direction. Guess what? The wind is coming from the opposite direction from that shadow. So I think when this way to wind on you and calm the wind coming that way. I think what I want to do now for the next one, which is what two years, three years. Well, there's one in, in December of 2020. All right. Well, I'll have this part. Let's get this plan out. Yeah. The one that's can be. I want to set up. I want to. I want to. I want to set up on a hill. Yes. You know what I'm saying? So then because because of the gradient in the in the uh, in the terrain, I'll be able to, to actually see it coming because we were kind of in like a city. It had hills, but there was so much stuff on top of us and so much stuff around us. And like yeah. we we're in the parking lot of a church and there was just like too many buildings in the way. So I wouldn't have been able to tell see the, that see the that. shadow was the yeah. shadow was rushing in. But if I'm if I'm at the top of a hill and in that 100 percent totality, so then I'll be able to see yeah. everything coming. Oh, so, so I got to so set up several so, cameras. So when I was in 1991, we chose to go to um, uh, Mauna Kea for that eclipse. And we could, we're could we on the slope of Mauna Kea. We could see off towards Maui, right? And we could see the moon shadow coming for many seconds across the water. Oh, that's cool. The dark is coming. And then, uh, for example, I've been in another spot is you decide to go to near the end or the beginning of an eclipse where the, where the, the, the sun's at a low horizon. So mm. the shadow coming, instead of coming straight down on you, comes at a gradual angle. So like in Australia, we were at the very end of the eclipse. When the eclipse ended, you could look up and see the shadow coming overhead, going way off towards the distance. You could see it's this, this sharpness going across there as it's racing away. It, it is just so... There's that's a lot cool. of things that see this. That, that, that's, that's why I've seen 17 and I want to see my 18th. I'm one. hooked. At, out, out. We're going to sail to the Marquesas Islands and head in the Pacific. Um, 2021 is in Antarctica. 
and then 2024 goes across Mexico and the United States. Uh, and I know where that's going to be, and I know there's one in 2020. <laughs> By the way, there's a there's a different types of eclipse. Again, folks, you need to be in totality, right? Not yes. 99 percent, 99 percent, 99.9 percent, 100 percent. You need to be in the shadow. It it it, it, it it's the the. It I mean, is the craziest thing. It is it, it is the it craziest is, thing I've ever seen. And even though I know accurately what's going to happen, right? I do the calculation that can predict it within a tenth of a second what's happening. When it happens, my brain just turns a mush. I mean, it's, it, it's so cool. <laughs> which is why <laughs> I do experiments. I have experiments run themselves because it is just, it is an extraordinary experience to see that. You know, I've been fortunate. I've, I have nearly 50 minutes of time in totality uh, in my life. Um, I'm looking at it out of power. And as I say, you can plan this stuff. The nice thing is that that a total solar eclipse is worth going to their side of the world to see. Mm -hmm. it, 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 and then you can start picking. You want to be on the edge. You want to be in the center. You want to be long, short, those sort of things. But but um, when you're there, then you can go and tour around. So I'm going to be going through the Marquesas Islands, these beautiful Polynesian islands that are halfway between French Polynesia and Hawaii with wonderful people, interesting culture. I'll be able to see all that stuff and then go and see an eclipse. 2021, it'll be going through Antarctica. Um, so I get to go back there. Yay. And 2024, that's 2027. It goes through the Mediterranean, through southern Spain, along the North African coast. Ooh, that um, sounds like one to be at. And so there's great stuff to go going through. For example, Alexandria, right? It's going to go through. Oh, uh, cool. And so forth. You can see that that path going across there. So there's a bunch of stuff to see, and we know where these things are. But but trust me, if you've never been in a total solar eclipse, one day, you don't know what you're missing. All right, I got to end this. I'm seven minutes past my time. <laughs> sorry, here, so. sorry. It's no cool. It's cool. It's cool. It's it's very, it, it, you can tell. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, I brought it. He so, brought it up, not me. I didn't bring up the the greatness of eclipses. That was all Landon. I didn't even get to ask about mag mag uh, magnitude brightness. I didn't get to ask about that, but it's okay. He'll be back. Or Kugel blitzes. Is there, is there an after show? Here? No, I gotta I, I gotta go. Um, well, you guys can do it as you want. Uh, he, you know, by the way, Mikey has his own channel. He can bring you over there if he wants. Yeah, we go. To but it's, but it's late for him. I'm sure he's got to go to bed. Because he's, yeah, not tonight. Not tonight. Uh, all right. But anyways, uh, thanks, Landon. Uh, pleasure as always. Uh, we got some other stuff we're going to be talking about with uh, Landon coming up uh, when he has time, which is vol volcanism. Um, we still got a yes. whole thing to do on volcanism to talk about. Volcanoes are doing interesting things. Uh, we also got um, uh, Dr. Kroon is going to come in and talk about astrophotography if you want to come in on that particular episode if you're available. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to be doing a little bit about, like I said, if if, if all things go right tomorrow, then I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, atheist <laughs> faith. <laughs> That's gonna go over really bad. <laughs> if you still well, have faith, will oh, you God. define your terms first before you talk. Yeah, about yeah, faith? yeah. And I will. I mean, it's it's yeah. it's about I'll talk about faith based commitments, which everybody has, atheist or not, it doesn't really matter. So yeah. it, you know, when you say well, atheists have faith, is it? It's it's kind of a true statement if you're meaning atheists as in humans, because humans have some form of faith based commitments. But we'll get into that tomorrow. I don't want to trigger everybody tonight because they'll lose their freaking minds and downvote. Yeah, which I, I don't care because I'm not even showing my likes and dislikes any longer this year. It's just a waste of time. Uh, if I could do a plug, you know, if sure. this is the kind of content you like, please support it. People like Steve love to do it because they love to do it, but they also need the funds. So if you can go on Patreon uh, or contribute to PayPal or other Koreans or stuff, please do so. Uh, you know, that, that, that again, if you want to see this kind of content on on you know uh the internet support creators like this and i appreciate Please. it and i do have my patreon it is in the video description um i do prefer patreon over anything else but if people want to do that and or like uh be a member of the channel then you hit the join link uh, that works uh, as well patreon is just um a little bit cost more efficient uh yeah. because they take less out but uh, if you want to become a, a, a patreon then the link is in the video description and it's in the live chat and also hit that join button it's only a couple bucks a month and that you get and a little green subscribe. thing so it's free to yeah. subscribe to that right and it helps out on there if i could also give uh could i give a couple of other plugs for yeah go to us um in time uh folks um they, they do a great a great job there uh milwaukee atheists Yep. Uh, are another group of people Very good. That, that, that I highly recommend. And if you want to have some fun and just kick back and, and laugh, uh, Isaac Butterfield and Pimp Monk. 
There we go. A little bit of plugs. All right, with that, guys, thanks for watching tonight. This was a fun rum and coke. It wasn't like our usual rum and cokes. Like I said, I, um, I've only had a little bit because my stomach just can't take much. Alcohol. I only had I only had one. Yeah. I have only one coke left, so we have to do another rum and coke. Night. And usually it's a little more, more open, but I thought this would be kind of a special treat, kind of rum and coke night, because uh, Landon was dealing a lot with with Beetlejuice, and we love listening to Landon, and we like learning about Beetlejuice. Oh wait, over here, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Go up and and look at Ryan. Yeah, and, there and, and notice it's notice a, it's a winter skies. You can see it. Yeah, and, yeah. and notice that, that, that. Remember when when you see Rigel, the blue guy was there on the other side. It used to be as bright as that. Now, Bellatrix, which is the the, the for the northern hemisphere, the so Betelgeuse is sort of like the left shoulder for northern hemisphere. Bellatrix is the right shoulder. Um, it's about the brightness of Bellatrix. It used to be as bright as Rigel. So you can go up there and actually see this. Now maybe it'll brighten up again. Uh, we don't know. Uh, so you can go out there and see this effect, right? It's, it's as an unusual effect, and you can go out and do actual real observational astronomy. So keep looking out. Keep looking up. Keep looking out for each other. That's actually a pretty good way to go out. <laughs> good night, all. Ciao.